Our first speaker today is Ariel. She was raised in Jonesboro. She went to McNary Central High School. She says that's out in the sticks somewhere. She had an internship this past summer at ETSU in a forensic science lab, and that was actually the second year that you had done that, right? Or at least your second rotation with them. So a second rotation with them. Ariel is interested in forensic science. Um, currently, she and I are working on applications for a medical technologist uh, program at Vanderbilt, which would allow her to get some clinical experience in labs, be certified to run a lot of clinical tests, and use that as a stepping stone for forensic science, maybe um, hospital clinical uh, technician uh, in the lab. This particular program would allow Ariel to actually be in charge of a lab that runs a lot of clinical exams. So as a result of her interest, she's actually looked at uh, drug detection uh, techniques in neonates. So Ariel, at the risk of butchering your last name, I didn't do it because I know what it is like to have a last name that can be butchered. So it's now up to you. You're welcome. Today I'm going to be speaking about the drug detection in neonates. A prevalent problem for pediatricians today is the need to treat newborns for the exposure of drugs that they have um, experienced while in the womb. The way that these children experience these, um, the way that the children are exposed to these drugs is the mother, while she is pregnant, takes the drug. And while she takes it, it is passed through her bloodstream and into the child through the placenta, which is where they get most of their nutrients. And it, once it is in their body, it causes havoc anywhere in their body. It can also pass through the blood-brain barrier into the brain if it is, has the correct lipophilicity. And the way that a child is checked to make sure that it wasn't exposed to drugs is as soon as it is born, it is assessed by way of visual inspection, by weight, temperature, and head circumference, and things of that sort, and also by the APGAR scale. The APGAR scale is done at one in five minutes after birth, and it scales the heart rate, respiratory rate, muscle tone, reflex irritability, and skin color of the child. And it is done on a scoring of zero to two, with zero being absent or not there, and two being completely there. A child with a score of anywhere from zero to five needs a pediatrician right away and needs to go to the NICU and be taken care of. A child with a score of five to seven will need a little bit of help, maybe some oxygen, but after a couple of days they should be fine. And a child with a score from eight to ten is considered healthy and needs no help from a pediatrician. The FR scale can also be infected by a difficult birth, as in a woman going into premature lab labor causing the child stress, or if a woman takes pain medication while in labor, as in an epidural, it can also delay the APGAR scoring because the medication delays the child's responses to the pediatrician when they are born. Exposure to drugs while in utero can cause many complications. While the mother is pregnant, it can cause placental abruption, which is where the placenta actually detaches from the uterus. And it can also cause preterm delivery and stillbirth. After the child is born, it can cause more complications, including low birth weight, asphyxia, which is where the oxygen level is too low for the child to breathe on its own, an increased risk of immunodeficiency diseases, as in getting a yeast infection over and over. Neonatal abstinence syndrome, which I will talk more in detail about later, and sudden infant death syndrome. Neonatal abstinence syndrome is the equivalence of an adult going with going through withdrawal symptoms. The mother who is pregnant takes the drugs and she becomes addicted, and while she becomes addicted, the child also becomes addicted. The, born, the baby is then born and no longer is exposed to the drugs and therefore goes through withdrawal symptoms, which in a child is called neonatal abstinence syndrome. These symptoms can last up to six months. In order to lessen the symptoms, 
of neonatal abstinence syndrome, physicians need to know the drugs involved along with the baby's general health. And it's also good to know the type of drug that was taken, how much it was taken, and for how long it was taken. The symptoms of withdrawal in adults and newborns are very similar. The adult symptoms of withdrawal can include tremors, nausea and vomiting, paranoia, and cramps. A child going through neonatal abstinence syndrome can have seizures, hyperactive reflexes, trembling, and excessive crying. When a child shows examples of the symptoms of neonatal abstinence syndrome or having any kind of developmental problems, a, a pediatrician may recommend that the child be tested for drugs just in case that may be the reason and to be able to treat the child for the symptoms of NES in order to lessen the pain that they are going through. Whenever they uh, request tests to be ran, they can specify which biological matrix they want tested. Types of biological matrices can include urine, blood, meconium, hair, plasma, and nails. The three that I'm focused on for my study were urine, hair, and meconium. Urine is the most widely used matrix for drug, te drug detection. It is easy to obtain from adults because everyone has to go pee. But for children, it is harder to obtain, especially from a newborn, because you end up having to catheterize the child, and a child going through neonatal abstinence syndrome is already in enough pain. If you try to catheterize them, it's gonna hurt even more. So sometimes you can't obtain enough urine in order to test for the child. And there's also a small detection window, since a lot of drugs are metabolized quickly and excreted through the urine, most drugs that are internalized only show in the hair or only show in the urine if they were internalized within a couple of hours or days before birth. So they would testing urine wouldn't be a very reliable source of information for treating neonatal abstinence syndrome since the drug was only shown to be taken for a couple of hours or days before birth. In order to develop neonatal abstinence syndrome, the drug needs to be taken for a longer extended time for the child to become addicted to that drug. Hair is the second matrix that I looked at, and it begins to grow early in development as it starts to grow in the third at the beginning of the third trimester. It has a long storage for testing because as the hair grows on the child, any um, toxin that is internalized, as you can see in the picture, goes through the bloodstream and enters the hair follicle and is grown out with the hair shaft in the cortex and is stored in the cortex. So when the child is born, you can collect the hair and it's pretty much like a bank for the drugs, as long as the hair isn't exposed to the elements for more than three months. After three months, you can no longer test the hair as the concentration of the toxins in the hair is degraded. The availability <laughs> of hair on newborns is different for everyone. Some children are not born with hair at all, some are born with a lot, so of course if the child is born without hair, you can't test it. And also parental consent is a problem because you have to have parental consent to cut the child's hair to be able to test it. And some parents, if their child is born with hair, do not want their hair cut if there are other things that you can test like urine or meconium that's going to be disposed of anyway. Meconium is the last matrix that I looked at, and it is the earliest developing matrix that can be tested as it begins to develop in the second trimester. And as it develops, it collects all of the toxins taken into the body with, from the tr second trimester on, as the hair did, like a bank. So any drug that was internalized is stored in the meconium. Meconium is actually the first three days of stool that a baby passes, and there is no set time for all children when meconium turns into normal stool. Most people just go by the color and texture because if you test somewhere around the second and third days of meconium, it can be a mixture of meconium and stool and it can actually throw off your results. So the first and second days are usually more reliable than the third. It has a, a very long storage because it can be frozen for up to a month and tested. 
without degrading the concentration of toxins in stored inside. But the main con of testing meconium is that it needs multiple steps in order to be able to be analyzed because you cannot just put meconium into a machine and run it because it's kind of thick and nasty and it's going to you know, plug up your machines and you're not going to be able to use them for a while because you have to be fixed. So in order to test meconium, you have to put in an organic chemical which will pull out the drugs from the meconium and absorb them and then you test the organic layer that is pulled off which will uh, which will contain all of the drugs that were in the meconium. An example of an organic solvent that they would use would be chloroform. I used it in my internship to pull out cocaine and its meta metabolites and then we would test the organic layer for the cocaine instead of the meconium. So the purpose of my study was to determine which of the three biological matrices should be used as a standard to test for prenatal drug exposure, urine, hair, or meconium. I used two separate studies to be able to have a wide array of examples. The first was a study conducted by Barals et al., which compared hair and meconium. And the second was a study conducted by Lopez et al., which compared meconium in urine. My hypothesis was that meconium is the most accurate and efficient of the three biological matrices listed and therefore should be used as a standard for prenatal drug exposure. Study 1, conducted by Barres et al., took 185 pairs of hair and meconium that were collected over a two-year period in Ontario, Canada, and tested for cocaine and opiates. They were all analyzed on immunalysis to make sure that they did contain cocaine and opioids, or opiates, and then they were quantified by the GCMS, or the gas chromatography mass spectrometer. The sensitivity for the hair and meconium was then calculated to see which one had a higher or lower uh, sensitivity for the cocaine or the opiates. This is the first um, table from the results, which showed the pairs that were positive in hair and meconium, positive in hair and not in, or positive in meconium and not in hair, positive in hair and not meconium. All of the positive samples, all of the negative samples, and the total samples tested. This table shows the results of the calculated sensitivity for meconium in hair. As you can see, meconium had a statistically higher um, sensitivity than hair in all of them except for opiates. There wasn't a real uh, drawn out reason why. They just stated that they had pretty much the same sensitivity. And cocaine and cannabis, meconium was greatly higher in sensitivity than hair. So the conclusions from the study conducted by Barras et al. was that meconium had a substantially higher percent sensitivity than hair when testing for um, when testing for cocaine, but not opiates. But does this outweigh the problems with using meconium, as in the more steps that you have to use to be able to test meconium, which means more time consumed and more money put into testing, compared to hair, which can just be analyzed the way it is. But then again, hair also has its own cons as whenever it is, whenever it is tested, the melanin that is contained in the shaft can actually interfere with the test results. So both have their pros and cons for testing. Study two conducted by Lopez et al. used samples obtained from the clinical hospital of Santiago de Compostela in Spain. The meconium and urine were collected at certain times. Meconium was obtained at the first, second, and third days after birth. The urine was collected at 14, 36, 60, 80, and 103 hours after birth. 
Um, once they were collected, they were tested by GCMS to obtain the results. These are the year-end results. They did no uh, quantitative analysis for the year-end. They only did qualitative. So the results showed that at 14 and 34 hours after birth, the year-end showed results of positive cocaine and opiates. But after 34 hours, there were no positive samples. So after 34 hours, the child had already eliminated all of the drugs that were in their system of cocaine and opiates. These are the results of the meconium. As you can see, they detected cocaine and opiates at very low concentrations. And after day two, the concentrations detected were at such a low level, they were statistically considered zero. That could be because of the mix of meconium and stool, or it could have just been straight stool that they were testing. The conclusions from study two conducted by Lopez et al. was that meconium can show drugs consumed within the last 20 weeks of gestation at very low concentrations since it has a very high sensitivity. While urine can only show exposure for, of drugs for a few hours before birth, and it's very hard to get a more quantitative analysis from the urine results whenever they're at very low concentrations. of the three biological matrices listed and therefore should be used as a standard for prenatal drug detection. My final conclusion is that meconium is very accurate but is not completely the most efficient. Since it has many cons along with the others, it is best that we consider my hypothesis incorrect because it's not the most accurate and efficient it is more accurate to restate it as um, which biological matrix should be used is best to be determined by the situation instead of adopting one as a standard for all testing. In some situations, it may be needed to test the urine first, and after the urine is positive, you can obtain another matrix and then test it. Or you can test two at one time to make sure that they're both showing the same thing, so it's not a lab error but it's best not to set either meconium or hair as a standard for all drug testing. that you posed in your presentation was, uh, do the cons outweigh the use of meconium? Mm -hmm. So in that particular study, study one, do you, do you think that the, that the cons outweigh the use of meconium? And if yes, then why? From a laboratory aspect, since I worked with one, I don't feel like the cons really outweighed it because all you had to do was insert a certain organic chemical and spin it and then take off the organic layer and test the organic layer. And to me, it didn't feel like it took that much more time or effort to do that because you have to do it with all of your samples anyway. All you're doing is adding just a little bit more. And if it's positive, just like any of the other samples, you have to run extra tests anyway to make sure that it's that drug that you're looking for and it's not a mixture of other metabolites. So on a personal level, I don't feel like the cons outweigh it. I feel like it would be the most efficient since it's the most sensitive and it develops earlier than any of the other ones. So it shows a greater bank of information. How do the, how do the, excuse me, how do the nurses get the meconium? How do the diapers? They sort of steal it out of the diaper. Mm -hmm. I 
was going to put a lovely picture up there for you, but I figured a lot of people had just seen the supper, so it might not have been a good idea. It's pretty nasty looking. Because babies that are babies that are in distress will expel meconium before they're born. That is whatever the they do that you can't test it because it's yeah. contaminated by all of the other fluids and you kind of can't really get a hold of it without getting the other fluids. So, so in those know, times you would have to use it in other times. Do you have do you know if for those babies do they have enough left that you can get out of get it out of the diaper? They didn't state it, but you're, the meconium that's expelled on the second day is just as, almost just as well as the first. It may have lower levels, but as the results on the second, the second one showed, um, the levels on the first and second day were still there, but after the second day is when they dropped. Why, why are these tests ordered by the doctor? Is it to figure out a course of treatment for the baby if they find that it actually has drugs in the system, or is it for I would think it would be both because if you saw a child suffering through NAS, it's very miserable. Like you've heard of adults going through it, and it's bad enough for them, but for a helpless child to be going through it, it's just so much more painful. And they can give the child medication to help subdue it, but in order to be able to, I guess, help the courts convict the parent if needed, it would be good to have the results stating which drugs it was in case they had a prior history of them. In your first study, you showed the sensitivities uh, as it relates to cannabis uh, with hair and meconium. Are there, did, did you see any numbers with the sensitivity for cannabis when it, in regards to urine? They didn't calculate the sensitivity. They didn't do any quantifiable um, analysis at all with the urine. They just took qualitative, either positive or negative.